It's good to be here this morning. It's good to be together in the house of the Lord to worship. It's an honor and a privilege that we should prepare our hearts for and be very thankful for. We were to welcome Elder Cliff Lockley, who we always enjoy hearing speak with us this morning. But he has some sick children and sickness in his family. He didn't want to bring that to the church. He, he feels fine that we, that we know of, but he didn't want to maybe bring something to the church. So he's not with us this morning. So we will lift his family in prayer today. We certainly miss him. Uh, he always does a wonderful job when he comes to us and speaks. So we miss him. We pray for their well-being. The worst thing in the family is sick children. I would rather be sick myself than the children be sick. So we pray for them and we'll miss them today. Our next fellowship lunch is next Sabbath, October the 7th. Our speaker will be Tom Polk. So please plan to stay with us. If you're a little hesitant about staying for fellowship lunch, I don't think you'll regret it. Bring food. You don't have to bring food. Just come as you are. Enjoy yourself. Uh, it's usually a good time. Our next church board meeting is October 15th at 8.30 in the morning. Some board members will be at our evangelism outreach at the flea market that Sunday morning, but if you aren't scheduled for that flea market that morning to give out literature and such, please try to be at the board meeting so that we will have a quorum for us. Prayer meeting Tuesday at 4 o'clock continues in the fellowship hall here, chapter 69 of the Desire of the Ages. Vivian does a great job leading that study. That's at 4 o'clock Tuesday afternoon here at the Fellowship Hall. Thursday Bible study continues at the home of Carolyn. The address is in the uh, bulletin here. And they're studying and reading Bible promises from the book, Bible Promises for Everyday Life. Uh, Carolyn gave out some copies of that book, and it's a really good written book. Our next lady's lunch is October the 3rd, which is this week, 1145 at the Red Bow Restaurant on Selby's Road in Rockville. For all the ladies, October 3rd. Communion, communion and our ordinance of humility, which is always a very nice service. They're planned to be part of our worship service on Sabbath, October 21st, if you'd like to put that in your calendar, October 21st. Wanda and Pat Plott will be serving that day as our elders. We will have communion practice on 5 p.m. on Tuesday the 17th, following the Bible study. The ladies got together on Sunday a couple of weeks ago and made some quilts and did some quilting. Those quilts will be on display in the sanctuary. So watch for it. Uh, they're made by the ladies in the congregation that's to be given to needy families. It's a great outreach that people love these quilts. Our current community service project is monetary contributions to the Pilgrim's Inn Food Pantry in lieu of making canned food donations. We're giving money. So label your tithe envelope for the Pilgrim's Inn Food Pantry if you will. We have volunteer opportunities both at the Oakland Baptist Clothing Ministry Center and the Pilgrim's Inn Food Pantry. See Carolyn if you're interested in volunteering at either of those ministries. Check the literature rack in the lobby for free items. There's Steps of Christ, Bible Studies, many things that you can give out to people as you meet them during your week. CJ is going to speak to us about our evangelism outreach. Morning. Morning. I just want to just briefly go over the outreach we're going to do at the flea market uh, in Fort Mill. Uh, we're going to do this for at least four weeks, possibly longer. But when I went up yesterday and talked to the lady, uh, we're only able to, to do this from behind the table that we're at. We cannot do it in front of the table. So when we was thinking of having maybe 12 people, we will be squeezing in probably six people behind the table where we at. So, you know, if you're interested, I've got the paper here with the four weeks. If you would just, I'm gonna let it up front, just check the weeks that you're available. Now you may not be able to participate that week because we can only have six. And we got to have at least 
two people in there speaking Spanish. Probably more than that because there are a lot of Latinos up there, which is also a blessing too. Um, so we would, those who, who volunteer to do this, be willing to pass out literature, be willing to talk to people, be willing to answer questions, of course you may have questions that come your way. Um, you know, the first booth will have the first ones behind the booth really is, is handing out stuff. The ones in front of the booth will be most giving out the literature and talking, but they're not gonna let it happen that way. So. But I will lay this out in front so that you will are interested. The ones that have told me you're interested, your names are on here. Uh, if you want, I had to add, but I'll just leave them out in front. If you could do this today, it would be great if you're interested. So I can get a schedule up for next Sunday. And we have to, we probably need to be there at 8 o'clock. So we're prepared to go at 9 o'clock. We've got the Steps of Christ in Spanish and English. We've got some desire of ages, some great controversies. We've got a lot of little, little leaflet hand out. One is going to have a lot of stuff from the radio station. And the, sh uh, the shirts might even look like this. It says Seventh day Adventist Church with the radio station information on the back. I think the shirts look very well. And we're also going to have a list of all the local churches in the area. So if someone decides to visit the church, They'll have options of where they'd like to visit. Um, and again, like I said, we would do at least four weeks. It's like $20 a week, which is really not much because there's thousands of people. So this could be a good outreach. I think, Sister Wanda, there's an article, was it Southern Titans? Yes. About harvest at the flea market. So it could be something. But, you know, if even one person, regardless, gives their life to Christ, it's all worth it. Amen. It's all worth it. And I do have one announcement. Stephen asked me to, uh, to announce today is October the 15th, yeah, 14th, 15th, two weeks from today. Anyhow, uh, they're gonna go to the Winthrop Lake and they're gonna have a picnic uh, around 1.30. They have extended that invitation out to the Rockfield Church and also to the Rockfield Hispanic Church. They have an invitation also. So it would be good if we could participate in that. It'd be a picnic, picnic lunch, bring your chair, a blanket, and just your own picnic lunch and fellowship together. I think it'd be a great thing. But he did ask me to extend that invitation. Where was it? I'm sorry? At the Winthrop Coliseum Lake, where they used to have like a little golf course at one time, there's a lake next, I think it's close to the Coliseum, maybe. Uh, not exactly sure. Exactly the location. Is it? Okay. But yeah, they did extend that invitation. Uh, they're just trying to do something to get York and Rock Hill and Hispanic Group more together, which is a good thing. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So, but anyhow, I will leave this in the back. If you're interested, just check the weeks. Please check more than one week in case you're not able to do the first week or if we can only have six. But we're probably continue on that four weeks if, if things are going well. Thank you much. Jim, Jim, did I make an announcement? That's right. I'm sorry, I forgot. Absolutely. I, thank you. I heard from the pastor this morning and he has graciously offered to stay after for Bible study on Tuesday uh, and share with us some information about how to give Bible studies. And I know some of us are um, involved in that. So if anybody would like to hear some information from the pastor, which I think would be very, very much appreciated. Uh, that's Tuesday after Bible study. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, CJ, for organizing the flea market outreach. We are gathered this morning to worship and praise the living God of heaven and earth. Amen. We are gathered to worship together in the body of Christ by his Holy Spirit, by the power of his Holy Spirit. On this morning, may we focus on God's greatness, his goodness to each of us, his great love for us, his kindness, his power, his amazing grace, 
and the atoning, saving sacrifice that Christ made for each one of us. Mm, I like that. Paul lays it out very, very clearly for us in Romans chapter 5. I would like to ask you to turn with me to Romans chapter 5 if you would. It'll be well worth your time. Some of you may be familiar with this text. It's a favorite of mine. When things are going well, it's a good text to read. Romans chapter 5. When things aren't going well, it's a good text to read. We're going to read the first 10 verses of Romans chapter 5. The first five verses are talking about, Paul is talking about how our faith actually helps us triumph when we have trouble. Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It's almost like Paul is writing a praise service there, isn't it? Look at verses 6 through 10 where he's talking about how Christ died in our place. I'd ask you to look closely at these words. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I think you can search through the Bible and find other good texts that help us praise the Lord, but this is about as good as any, is it? Jesus took the sins of all upon himself. He paid the supreme sacrifice for all of mankind. He paid for every sin of every human who has ever lived, who is living now, or who will ever live. Jesus took it all. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies. Jesus fulfilled all the promises. Jesus prevailed over all evil. Jesus saved us. Because Jesus died, we can live. But for us to live, Jesus asked us to die to ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him. And in doing this, we may have life eternal. Amen. We owed a debt that we could never repay. But Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Would you join me now in our call to worship if you would stand for us?
For by and through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, we may claim the promise of eternal life that is available to all who will accept your loving call. This morning we celebrate with joy your great love for us. May we understand the power of that love that you have for us, Lord, so that we may be saved from our sin by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we ask for your presence now as we seek to honor you and worship you. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Please remain standing as we open our hymnals. I will follow thee, page two, I'm sorry, page six, two, three. I will follow thee.
Luke 6, 38 tells us, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Gloria and Enoch embarked on their long-awaited vacation. The plan was to spend a couple of days visiting their son's family and their three granddaughters, and then go to their favorite beach on the coast to enjoy the sun and water. But that Sabbath, as they attended church with their granddaughters, the pastor made a special offering plea to those in attendance to cover the expense of replacing the roof on the church. Gloria and Enoch felt impressed to donate all the money that they had saved for the beach location for the roof replacement. Then they would spend the rest of their vacation with their son's family instead of vacation. But to their surprise, when they returned home, Gloria found a letter in the mail from her work from the hospital stating that they had miscalculated her wages and needed to pay for her back wages. Enclosed was a check for exactly double what she and Enoch gave to the Adventist church, church to cover the roof. The Bible promises that when you give, it will be given to you. We invite you to give for the church budget so that the work and worship will continue here in Montfield. It is all of us in response to all of them. Will the deacons please come forward? now in our prayer anthem if you would and if possible please kneel the words to the prayer anthem are in the book Thank you. 
Father in heaven, we bow humbly before you this morning. We thank you for the many, many, many blessings that you give to each of us. Blessings that we need to recognize for so many. Lord, may we never take for granted that peace and that joy and that forgiveness that you offer to us. To all who will come to you with a repentant heart. Lord, forgive us our sins. Renew and refresh our hearts, our minds, and our entire lives, Lord. Help us to grow and be more Christ-like disciples of yours each day. Lord, we pray this morning for the well-being and the salvation of our families, of our friends, and for this world. We lift the hungry, Lord. We lift the hurting, the lonely, the lost, and the sick up to you this morning, Lord. We pray for the guidance and protection of our children, Lord. We ask that you equip us to help others discover that abundant life that we can have through Christ Jesus. We're thankful that you care so much for each of us, and we ask that you work in us so that we may be a people who truly care as well. Lord, we lift Elder Lockley's family this morning. We pray for healing and well-being for him, his family, his children. Be with them through this day and in the days to come. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Philippians two verses one to four. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like minded having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loveliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. May God bless the reading of his words. Amen. I know I keep stepping back up here, you're probably getting tired of looking at me by right now. But we do miss Elder Lockley this morning, and uh, I was asked to step in, and we'll do our best. I know we won't present the message that he has for us, but hopefully he can be here and present it to us another day. I'm sure we will. Thank you, Jeremy. Have you ever thought about what is the greatest menace to our society today? Stop and take just a second and think about what is the greatest menace, threat to our society and to your little world, big world, little world, mine's little, yours may be big, to your world, what's the greatest threat? What's my greatest enemy? How many of you heard of the statement, public enemy number one? There's many people have worn that terrible title throughout history. A lot of people don't realize, but Nero, the Roman Empire, was declared public enemy number one by the Roman Senate during a revolt by the northern territories of Rome. Nero was pretty rough. He did a lot of terrible things in society. He fled to the countryside with his remaining slaves and he eventually killed himself. 
In the roaring 20s and 30s, I wasn't alive. I don't think any of y'all were either. But when the FBI was formed, several people were declared public enemy number one. I know you've heard of John Dillinger, Pretty Boy Floyd, Babyface Nelson, Bonnie and Clyde, Al Capone. When somebody is declared that kind of public enemy, they're bringing a lot of hurt and pain to society, aren't they? It could be violence, drugs, broken families, death, or whatever. It's just bad. It's all bad. So as Christians, we might say that the number one menace to society is the devil. Would you say that? The number one enemy that I'm going to speak of this morning has caused more war, more divorce, more drug abuse, more persecution, more pain, more suffering, more heartache, and more death than any other enemy or individual in all of history. And even though Satan is at the root of a lot of things that are not bad, I'm not sure that it's the devil for me. So who is the primary number one enemy for me? Who is my greatest threat day in and day out? You know who it is? Yourself. It's me. To be truthful, the greatest enemy for me is me. I am my biggest enemy and often my biggest problem. When I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, I am looking at the biggest problem I have in being a Christian and a disciple. And I've told you before, as I prepare a lot of these messages, by the time I start, you know, by the time I get through the first two paragraphs, I'm already preaching to myself. <laughs> so I'm doing it again today, and I apologize. It's true, though, my biggest problem in being a Christian is my selfishness. That's the primary enemy for me and for the typical Christian. Selfishness, the Bible tells us, is the root of all sin and so much more. And if you listen to what Kate read in Philippians there, chapter 2, Paul spells it out. So in every, our message this morning, we're going to talk about the four parts of my problem of selfishness. We're going to talk about the condition cause, the crisis, and the cure. We're not going to pick on anyone this morning except me. But this is truly something that we all need to come to grips with at some point in our life. The condition of selfishness first. Selfishness brings so much misery into this world. Two children were riding on a little toy rocking horse. Little brother and little sister are bouncing around on it. And finally, the little brother said, if one of us would get off, there'd be more room for me. <laughs> Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, all doing our own thing. Judges 21, 25 there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Selfishness, if you think about it, is chronic. Sometimes it's hard for me to go five or ten minutes without thinking about myself. And when you really think about it, myself is the reason behind so many of the decisions that I make every day, aren't they? What is selfishness? The definition is this. Selfishness is being excessively or exclusively concerned with oneself, seeking one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being without regard for others. That's the key. Now, it's not necessarily a think about ourselves. It's not necessarily a sin to think about ourselves, is it? 
But whenever I do something selfish or I sin, I really don't need to say the devil made me do it. Sometimes when I sin, it's just because I wanted to. Be honest. The devil exploits my natural tendency towards selfishness, there's no doubt. But we are all naturally motivated by an ingrained love for ourselves. Without God, it can be a real battle for me and for all of us. This is why there exists so much selfishness in the world and sadly in the church today too. James 1, 13 through 14, and you'll hear a lot of text about this throughout the New Testament. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted to evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. Have you ever noticed that in that text? James 1, 13 through 14, by his own desires. There it is, right there, clear. I've got my own built-in desires, and I am enticed by these desires. I can't just always blame the devil. As I said, it's not a sin to love yourself, so don't get me wrong. We're just not supposed to love ourselves supremely. What is the great commandment? Love the Lord, love your neighbor as yourself. Have you ever noticed that the Bible never really commands us to love ourselves? Nowhere does God command us to love ourselves. I think it assumes that we already do and that we will. The things that are commanded in the Bible are things that we naturally have a problem with. The Bible says we shall not lie. Why does it say that? Because sometimes we might have a little tendency to tell a little stink. We are not to steal, to covet, and so forth. We're commanded not to do the things that we're naturally prone to do. There's not a commandment that says love yourself more because that comes naturally, doesn't it? It does for me. Without God, it is very easy to love myself the most. Quite a few verses in the Bible that say we should love our neighbors ourselves. Galatians 5, 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this you shall love your neighbor as yourself. James 2, 8, if you, for if you fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> my problem is I don't seem to have any problem with the loving myself part. The hard part for me is loving my neighbor as I love myself. And this is discipleship. Much of the entire gospel is summed up in what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now I know and you know that we would not be alive if we did not have some love for ourselves. We would never eat, we would never rest. We do need to take care of ourselves. We need to make good decisions in our lives. If we don't have a certain natural propensity to preserve our life, and to care for ourselves, we won't last very long, will we? As Adventists, we believe in taking care of our bodies in the temple of God. But I want you to listen to this sentence here. Many people who are really liberated and happy are the ones who just take up their cross daily, they just be themselves, and they just love other people. They're not so worried about what everybody thinks of them because they're dead to themselves. When we're crucified with Christ and when we die to ourselves daily, we are truly happier and this leads to true discipleship in a person. 
So what is the cause of the problem of selfishness? I know you've heard of the word narcissism. It comes from a Greek mythology about a character named Narcissus, who was a very handsome hunter. One day while going through the woods, he saw this crystal clear pool of water. He leaned over the pool to get a drink. He saw his reflection and he was so enchanted with his own reflection that he fell in love with his reflection. He could not pull himself away from the pool and he ultimately starved to death there all because of his love for self. That is where the word narcissism originated in the Greek. The Bible says that selfish thinking began with a beautiful heavenly being that was so in love with himself that he wanted to be like the Most High God. Isaiah 14 speaks of the devil, Lucifer, not being happy with his glorified station in heaven. He was a beautiful angel, brilliant and smart, but he decided to reverse the heavenly quotation. Equation, excuse me. The equation is to love the Lord with all our heart, to love our neighbor as ourselves, but Lucifer loved himself much more. Honestly, the secret to happiness, according to the Bible, is found in the word joy, Jesus, others, yourself. The word sin has I right in the middle of the word. The word pride has I right in the middle of the word. Pride and selfishness are at the heart of so many of our and my problems in society today. Marriage counselors say overwhelmingly that the dispute and friction in a marriage is almost always boils down to selfishness on one side or both sides. The devil wasn't happy with his station and position in heaven. He wanted God's place. Isaiah 14, 13, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer wanted to be God. If you think about it, all idolatry springs from selfishness. As a matter of fact, if you think about it closely, breaking any or all of God's commandments usually relates to selfishness of some kind, doesn't it? Love is the fulfilling of the law of God. Love and selfishness are polar, exact opposites of each other. The motive behind everything the devil does is selfishness. He is completely preoccupied with self-love and pride. Jesus is the ultimate diametric antithesis and opposite of the devil. The devil is completely controlled by a motive of self. Jesus was completely controlled by love for others. When we say God is love, that is a very deep and meaningful statement. All of us are struggling every day, whether we admit it or not, between these two motives in our hearts, love and selfishness. But when, we're able, when we are willing and able to walk in a Christ-like manner, it's because the Holy Spirit has put the love of God in our hearts. Steps to Christ on page 17 says it really well. Man was originally endowed with noble powers and a well-balanced mind. He was perfect in his being and in harmony with God. His thoughts were pure. His aims were holy. But through disobedience, his powers were perverted and selfishness took the place of love. Selfishness took the place of love. 
When Adam and Eve were created, their hearts were filled with love for God and love for each other. After their sin, God said, what did you do? Adam said, it was that woman that you made. Eve said, it's that snake that you made. So they began to blame each other. And from that day to this day, every baby born is born with a bit of a selfish nature, aren't they? James 3, 16. Listen closely. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Is self-seeking not the foundation for every evil thing? Think about what goes on in the world. Self-seeking self -seeking is the foundation for every evil thing. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men. So often the strife, the disagreements, the arguments that we see in the world, and even in the church, are just shrapnel from selfishness. As maturing, growing Christian disciples of Christ, we must learn to guard against the disease of selfishness every day. We need to be constantly aware of it all around us. A mother was preparing pancakes for her children. Kevin was seven. Ryan was five. They began to argue with each other about who was going to get the first pancake. The mom thought, you know, this is a good teachable moment. So she said, if Jesus was here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. So at that point, Ryan turned to Kevin and said, Kevin, you get to be Jesus today. <laughs> I just assume you had already heard that one. <laughs> but it's true. Selfishness sneaks in there constantly. So now we've looked at the condition and the cause. Let's look at the crisis itself. We all have this condition because of the first sin in Eden. We're all born with this selfish nature. Don't be too hard on yourself. You're born with it. Children, bless their little hearts and grandchildren too. They do the most lovable, adorable, innocent things. But they can be very selfish too, can't they? Babies and children demand attention and they're really not too attentive to what our needs are, are they? Only theirs, but it's not their fault. They learn if they scream or pitch a fit, they just might get what they want. Sadly, too many people struggle to ever grow out of that, don't they? Our selfishness is at the root of all our sin. This is why we need to recognize and acknowledge our greatest enemy. It's always easy to say it's the devil out there, it's his fault, the devil made me do it. But honestly, we realize we need to realize that it's something within each of us. Amen. We must recognize this, we must be aware of it always. And we need to deal with it on a personal level. Christian discipleship is about being selfless and putting others first exactly as Christ did. Jesus was never selfish. Christian discipleship is all about being more selfless like Christ. 
1 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. And I had never looked at this in this light, but it makes so much sense now. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. And then Paul goes on writing, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power of their love. Now he was on a roll there, but my goodness. But Paul was not writing that to say that this is what the world was going to be like one day. Paul was writing to the church of his day because the world has always been selfish like this. Paul is saying that in the last days, selfishness is going to be in the world and in the church. Selfishness, yes, even in the church. But notice the very first thing that Paul wrote in this verse. He said, men will be lovers of themselves. It appears that Paul is beginning by saying, here is the main problem. Selfishness. And all these other things will grow out of that. Have you ever read the text in that light? Paul seems to be saying that everything else that he's going to mention flows out of men being lovers of themselves. And again, I stress, it's not a sin to love ourselves in a healthy sense. But we're talking about being preoccupied with one's own self-comfort. William Gladstone, the British Prime Minister, said it so clearly. And I agree with you. Selfishness is the greatest curse of the human race. In Romans 2, 5 through 8, Paul says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, to them indignation and wrath. So if God's church is going to be filled with selfishness in the last days, how will it do God's work? How will the world know that we are Christians and that we are Jesus' disciples? You've heard this before lately and we need to hear it often. It is by how we love each other, not by how we love ourselves. If you want to be happy, love others. You want to be unhappy? Love yourself. The opposite of selfishness is love. The opposite of love is selfishness. The two great motives in our life for every decision that we make are love and selfishness. Most everything that we do in church, out of church, wherever, every day is very often determined by one of these two motives, love or selfishness. Every decision I make. And speaking of the church leadership, of the leadership of Israel at that time, Isaiah wrote this. Isaiah 56, 11. Yes, they are greedy dogs which never have enough. They are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain, from his own territory. Ezekiel wrote in chapter 34, 8, two very wise men, Isaiah and Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34, 8, for my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. 
Neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. There is a selfish, deluded, prosperity gospel floating around in the world these days, isn't there? It stems from selfishness. It has been wisely said, and I, I, I get tickled with this one, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew. <laughs> Too many good people are being led and influenced by this deluded prosperity gospel that we see all around us. Look at the history in the Bible of Israel. Every time the king went south spiritually, he took the kingdom with him. Every single time. When the king turned to idolatry, the people turned to idolatry. That's true in the church. Selfish pastors, selfish leadership will lead to selfish congregations. Flip through the channels these days, it's not hard to find. Pastors saying, if you'll give your seed gift of faith, God's going to open the windows of heaven for you. You'll get that new pickup truck, that new house, that promotion. You're going to get this and you're going to get that. And this prosperity preaching is not just in North America either. It is all over our world today. But those of you that know your Bible know that Jesus never preached anything that even resembles such as that, did he? Not even close. Christians are being exploited by spiritual leaders for selfish reasons. And chronic selfishness in society grows out of this. And this leads to what Paul was writing to Timothy about. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, and so forth. The only thing that's going to change selfish hearts across this world today is the love of God. Amen. That, that's it. It is so very refreshing for me to see a motive of just pure love, isn't it? How often do you see it? It's still out there. I see it sometimes. I think you do. Selfish people, selfless people are like a bent breath of fresh air, aren't they? You, ever, you get around somebody every day and they're completely about others and totally selfless, like a breath of fresh air. That's what brings people to a church and brings people to the Lord. We are to deny ourselves. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. That means denying my selfishness, taking up my cross, following him. Isaiah 30, 10 says, Who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophecy deceits. Satan's looking for pastors and preachers who will tell folks what they want to hear and inspire them in a worldly fashion, if you'll notice that. It's extremely popular in our society today. And the root of it is selfishness. People don't, want, don't tell me to repent of my selfish sins and then certainly don't get specific about my selfish sin because that's considered tasteless and I might even get offended. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers that will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 1,000 Christians were asked in a survey, why does my church exist? Sadly, the majority said the church's purpose was to take care of me and my family's spiritual needs. Are you surprised? I think everyone here sitting here today knows the purpose of the church is to win the world for Christ. 
When we come to church, we need to be loved, valued, blessed, edified, taught, inspired, encouraged, and we should be better because we came. Amen. Christ has called us into the church to be his body. Jesus came into the world to be a servant. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He wants us to do the work of God and to share the gospel. He wants us to feed the hungry and to help others. And not just to feed others with food, but to feed them with the bread of life. Amen. We can do this a great deal in how we live our daily lives. The world needs more Christians that are willing to serve. A selfish heart loves for what it can get. A Christ-like disciple's heart loves for what it can give. Kathy read Philippians 2, and I read verses 3 and 4 again. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. I love the story of the geese that were about to fly south for winter. They had to say goodbye to their little friend, the frog. They told the frog, it's time for us to head south. The frog said, why, why do you go south? Why are you going south? Their answer was, well, it's beautiful weather where we're going. It's all warm and sunny. The frog said, you know, I really don't like freezing over in my pond here every winter. Is there any way I can go with you? Well, the geese said, I, we really don't know how that's going to work. He said, well, what if I get a stick and each of you take hold of the end of that stick in your mouth and then when you take off, you get a running start. I'll hang on to that stick with my mouth and that way you can take me with you. Pretty good idea, wasn't it? <laughs> so they said, well, we're willing to give, us, give it a try since you're our friend. So it worked. They took off. The frog was hanging onto that stick by his mouth between the two geese as they flew. It was going well. They flew over a farmer. The farmer looked up and he said, would you look at that? I have never in my life seen anything like that. That is absolutely brilliant. I wonder which one of them thought of that idea. Well, the poor frog, he could not help himself. <laughs> he opened his mouth and he hollered as loud as he could. I did. <laughs> Now, we laugh at that because it's true, don't we? All he had to do was hang on quietly with his friends that were taking care of him, didn't he? But he could not keep his mouth shut. He just had to have the credit for that idea. Philippians 1, 15 through 17. The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The same problems we have today, Paul was dealing with in his day, wasn't he? He writes about it. So we've talked about the condition the cause and the crisis of selfishness. Let's look at the, the cure. To be honest, it bothers me to think about how the tentacles of selfishness intertwine with all of my thinking. Some of it I think is normal, like we said, if we're hungry, we need to eat, we need to care for ourselves. 
We don't have to feel bad about our normal self-preservation. If you want to look good when you're out in public, that's perfectly fine. It's okay to want to be presentable, and as Christians, we should take good care of ourselves. Taking good care of ourselves, looking presentable, all these things is not a sin and is not being selfish. It's when we don't love others as we should because we're preoccupied with ourselves that we get, that I get myself in trouble. I put a star by this. If I can take my eyes off of myself and fix my eyes on Jesus and think about the love that God has for others and for me, then that's when I can start to experience healing from this deadly disease of selfishness and become a true disciple of Christ. So what is the cure? 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well be. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well be. But sometimes I'd rather think more about me because I think thinking about me is more interesting. <laughs> But God says, no, you can't live that kind of life and be happy. You can't pull it off. You cannot live that kind of life and be happy. As I learned to see how Jesus values other people, I benefit greatly from loving others. Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. We all want happiness. We're all searching for it every day. Well, it must first be God, then others, then us, if we're to be truly happy and fulfilled. I must learn this deep within and understand this. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. He died for all, that those who live should no longer for themselves should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 again. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. When I say Jesus saved me from my sins, I really say he saved me from my selfishness. Amen. Because that's where my sin springs from. It's love or selfishness, the two great moves. Isaiah 53, 6, again, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All the suffering for the sins of the world that was laid upon Jesus on the cross of Calvary is because we went our own selfish. But when we decide to follow Christ, we cannot be living just for ourselves anymore. We follow him, we trust him. We see Jesus dying on the cross and it touches our hearts. Why do we love him? Because he loved us so greatly first. Why do we love others? Because he loves us so very much. And if God loves us so very much in this powerful way, shouldn't we be able to love others as he did and as he taught us and asked us to? Yes. Our life is either going to be a life of love for God and love for others, or it's going to be a life of living just for ourselves. And Lord, I don't want to have that selfish heart. I want the new heart that only you can give me. I want to live like a new creature. I want to be motivated by great love for you and for others. May God bless each of us with this new heavenly heart of Christian discipleship. Thank you.
Andrew will lead us in our closing hymn for Carolyn. Three on us. Stand as we sing our closing hymn. It's number 309, I Surrender All. Jesus' precious name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen.